over to you to tell us how we're going to get this good job economy. Um, thank you. Thank you, Torsten, and to the Resolution Foundation for having me here. Thank you for, for coming and uh, to all of those online who are, who are listening and, and watching. Um, so Torsten uh, promised more than what I'm going to <laughs> deliver. Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm sure you would have guessed that. Uh, I don't know how to create a good jobs economy. In fact, um, I feel um, that this is something that is, is, is relatively unprecedented given um, the changes in technology and the world economy. I think it's, it's, there are not examples we can draw on. And the kind of direction that I'm going to try to push you towards is really something that I'm drawn to not because there's anything particularly attractive about this orientation, but because of a process of elimination. That is sort of, you know, ruling, ruling out much easier, much more attractive and tried and tested um, kind of strategies of the past. So that, that is really a kind of a process of elimination that gets me to a point to say, okay, you know, we need to have this kind of a focus that's going to have all kinds of difficult and untested um, uh, implications for policy, and, uh, in, it does, in the, and it doesn't look like anything that, that we're really um, doing, including um, what's happening in the United States, and I'll, I'll talk about that um, also. So um, I, I don't want to bore you with a lot of stuff that you know. Um, this is, um, oh, here. So if I hold this like this, okay, um, that, you know, Britain is suffering from uh, a, a kind of a, pro uh, a productivity problem in the aggregate. Um, uh, but the part of it that I'm mostly concerned about is in terms of what it means for uh, the quality of jobs for um, the middle and lower middle classes. Um, uh, if you look at the, the last 40, 45 year period, um, those kinds of jobs have tended to do not so well um, in uh, most advanced uh, economies, uh, uh, definitely in the United States, but also um, to some extent uh, in the UK. That's important because if you want to build middle class societies, um, that sort of having jobs not just for the most skilled, but also for the uh, intermediate skill people in, in, in your economy uh, is extremely important. Um, a, a, a dimension uh, in, the, uh, in the UK which sort of overlaps but is not exactly one and the same in terms of this overall um, uh, uh, inequalities of economic opportunity and jobs is the kind of very high levels of regional inequality uh, in, in, um, in, in the um, uh, in the UK, so that outside London and the Southeast, uh, the problem of good jobs is also the problem of scarcity of good jobs in, in, in many other parts uh, of, of the UK, in, in other uh, uh, cities where productivity has been, has been um, lagging. Um, so if we're talking about a prosperity that's not going to be limited to a relatively few people, if it's a kind of a, an enhancement in productivity that we will hope it will trickle, trickle down, but in reality may not. Um, a, 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 so an economy that emphasizes inclusive prosperity is going to require a focus that is not just productivity, uh, but also uh, more productive jobs for uh, the bulk of the labor uh, force as well. Um, and that requires us really to address inequality um, uh, in, 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 in where it's created, in, in, in terms of you know, what kind of, of, of jobs are, are, are created, uh, what kind of skills people have. Um, and uh, since my emphasis is, is on good jobs, I should also say, uh, you know, um, make clear that even though pay uh, is uh, a very big part of it, um, it's not the only thing. And I think sort of, you know, we all know that you know, jobs matter a lot more than simply the income. It sort of, it, it in many ways defines us who we are and having jobs that, that not only pay well, but in, in, entail a certain amount of dignity, autonomy, uh, ability to progress and develop and so forth is, is all part of, of, um, of, of the good jobs uh, story. So um, I, I'm not aware of any of these indices for the UK, and there's probably are some, but in the United States, there's a, a wide variety of um, um, uh, 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 quantitative indicators that have been developed um, that, that sort of do this. 
Um, some of them uh, are based on uh, attitudinal surveys and, and surveying workers and asking them what do they care for. And of course, always pay is a big part, but they care a lot about flexibility, automation, um, how they treat it on the job as well. Uh, other um, uh, um, measures are based on sort of objective indicators of jobs, and the OECD actually has a, a cross-country database. I assume Britain is actually in, include, is included on that. Um, that has statistical indicators of earnings, labor market security, and the quality of the working, working environment. Um, so this, this, in other words, I mean, this, the notion of a, of a good job could be quantified and made more precise. And in fact, you know, one element of emphasizing good jobs would be to have indicators that you can actually track. Um, and I think uh, investing in that is obviously part of this. So um, now, what is the good job uh, industrial policy uh, connection? Um, I think a lot of the discussion on good jobs uh, tends to focus on a number of uh, dimensions where, um, where um, I, I think the, the, the kind of gains that we can make are sort of limited. Um, probably the first thing that people focus on when we talk about good jobs is focusing on the a supply side of labor market is the quality of skills and training and education. So, if, you know, so if people want good jobs, they need to have better skills they need to, in order to access better labor markets. Um, a, a second level might be to say, well, we need to have, you know, regulation standards. Um, and, 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 um, um, and the third might be to say, well, let's improve the bargaining power of workers uh, through unions or, or um, sectoral uh, uh, bargaining and things like that. And, and a final line of argument, which you hear probably a lot more in the US than I imagine it's in the UK, is the argument that it's actually it's in the interest of employers uh, to offer good jobs, uh, because by offering better jobs, you get more motivated employees that, that you know, quit less frequently, and therefore you reap the benefits of these you know, better jobs in actual, in actual productivity on the job, and therefore that's actually a profit-enhancing strategy. So if that was true, of course, you don't need to do you know, any sort of have any minimum wages or labor bargaining. In fact, the people who argue for that tend to be against unions because they, they sort of feel that it should be all businesses go doing this on their own for their for for the for the um, for um, uh, um, self-interested reasons. Now I think the reason that that these are sort of remedies that are limited um, is well first I mean our our, our number one two and three um, uh, you know remedy which is always training and and education well that's Yes, 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 but it's always, you know, it's it's always a solution to the future, never really a solution um, to the short short run. And I think, you know, my colleague at the Kennedy School, um, Ricardo Hausman, says that, you know, the the, the 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 purpose of an economic strategy is to create jobs for the people you have, uh, not to, for the people you wish you had. Um, and 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 so that's really about, you know, the the fact that training. Um, uh, investment, education, skills, all of that. I, I'm not, I don't want to de-emphasize that at all because I think that's definitely uh, a key part of this, but it can't be the entire strategy. Um, uh, there is some evidence from um, work um, by um, uh, Stansbury and company uh, that suggests that in fact this sort of wide regional gaps in productivity persists even after you control for education in the UK. So again, even there it's clear that even you know that may not be the, the uh, um, uh, solve the entire problem suggesting that there is something also happening on the demand side of labor markets that the, the productive ecosystems that create more productive jobs aren't in present uh, in the rest of, of the country. So it's not just going to be skills and education. And of course, we have these other counter arguments about how, you know, simply having higher minimum wages, you know, runs pretty clearly, pretty quickly into a kind of trade off between creating jobs versus in incumbents having a relatively high wage. And of course, France is a cl clear example of a country that has run into that kind of a trade off with very high youth unemployment rates. Um, and high wages for those who do have wages. Um, and also for the, 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 high, the high road argument, I think it's clear that that might be true for some employers, but it's really not an, an, uh, an argument that, that holds um, sway for the entire labor market. 
Okay, so I think that all is again, but you know, this is my process of elimination. So it's saying, where is this, you know, taking us? Well, it has to be that if you want to help, be able to provide good jobs for the bulk of the labor force, it has to be by enhancing sort of productivity. That you know, you have to have more productive jobs for the workers uh, that you do have and are likely to have uh, in the short to medium term. Um, so, how do you do that? And I think this is where. Um, the industrial policy connection comes in because industrial policy is about increasing productivity. Um, that is by fostering innovation and structural change uh, towards more productive ag activities. Um, I'm not going to go into the long-standing debate about the efficacies of industrial policy. I'm happy to talk about it, but I, I would argue that even the economics profession is going through a kind of a... a, 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 a a, a, a change of attitudes towards industrial policy from, I would say, extreme hostility to less extreme hostility right now. Um, the, um, um, but, and here is again uh, the sort of the crux, in, or, the, or we hit another problem, which is that when we talk about sort of how we talk about industrial policy today, so I've talked to you how we, when we talk about good jobs and labor markets, how that cannot be the full story. But when we talk about industrial policy, that's also the, our current discussion is leaving important things out. Because uh, today, the discussion about industrial policy or industrial strategy, certainly in the United States, but also gather in the UK, really focuses on things like manufacturing, on supply chains, on the green transition, on attaining global competitiveness. right? Um, and um, None of these actually have uh, good jobs at the center, um, even though, for example, in the context of the CHIPS Act in the United States, that's also listed uh, as one of the objectives. But one of my points here is going to be, and in fact, there's one point I want you to take away from my presentation, is that good jobs is going to require its own industrial policy, that it cannot be tagged on. Uh, as an objective on existing uh, industrial policies, whether it is uh, you know, advanced semiconductors and manufacturing, as in the case of chips, or it is um, the green transition. Um, uh, those are that, that you cannot ki kill all the birds uh, with, um, with one or two stones. That, that, and, and right now, really, at least in the case of the United States, and I believe that's true also in the UK, we don't have a coherent policy that is targeting uh, green jobs, uh, uh, good jobs, uh, directly. Um, so the reason that I think none of this is really, um, at, in the US, is really targeting good jobs fundamentally is because the bulk, bulk of the jobs of the future will not be uh, in manufacturing um, or in semiconductors. Um, the green transition itself is not a net job creator. Uh, it'll destroy a lot of jobs. Um, it'll create some jobs in other places, uh, but that's not really on its own unless you make green jo uh, good jobs an objective in and of itself. It's, it doesn't uh, address the problem. Um, um, okay, uh, so this again uh, is, is you know you know this the, the process of of manufacturing losing jobs. You know UK has been one of the sharpest. Uh, the, industri the industrializing countries, but that's it's really common, even Germany has the industrialized in employment terms. Uh, most of the jobs actually are in, in, in services, retail, uh, leisure and hospitality, and other um, uh, areas. And when you look at sort of which countries have actually in, in, you know, done well in manufacturing, um, you know, this is for a bunch of countries how they've done in terms of manufacturing output versus manufacturing employment. Um, even countries like um, oops, uh, South Korea, um, does this work? I'm not sure it works, but point, good <laughs> idea. So like, take like South Korea, for example, is, is in, at constant prices, manufacturing share and value added has continued to climb and it remains very high. But look at what's, sh what's happened to the employment share in manufacturing. So uh, even when you get, manage to experience output reindustrialization, uh, it's very, very unlikely that you will experience employment industrialization. We see this actually happening today in the United States. Um, so if you look at um, you know, what's happening to 
as a result of CHIPS and the IRA, so this concerted efforts at rebuilding industrial activity in, in the United States, whether it's semiconductors, advanced manufacturing, or, 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 or batteries, or electric vehicles, these are actually very, very capital and scale intensive industries. So what you get is actually, you know, after 2000, 2022, you get significant increase in investment in manufacturing. If you look closely at manufacturing output, you can convince yourself that even manufacturing output in the United States has bounced back up. But you know, employment is steadily and unhappily uh, trending downwards. There's no effect uh, on employment that you can actually see. And I'm afraid that's going to be the, 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 um, the general picture that we, on, on, with respect to the objective of creating good jobs in manufacturing, and that sort of manufacturing is where we're supposed to have those good jobs being created under CHIPS and IRA. That's simply not going to happen. Okay, so the bottom line diagnosis of the problem uh, is that you know, um, the central problem of our, the inability of our labor markets to create sufficient productive jobs um, will not be addressed as a byproduct um, of sort of our traditional approach to industrial policies or the approach that has been taken in the United States right now. And therefore, we need an industrial policy that's going to put job creation uh, front and center. Um, and that is going to have a certain element. It's going to focus on the demand side of labor markets in addition to the supply. So I'm not saying let's ignore skills and investment and training, but it'll have to focus at least as much on the demand side that is creating the positions, the firms uh, that are offering productive employment opportunities. It's going to be focusing mostly on services uh, and in manufacturing. And higher productivity is going to be the sine qua non uh, for uh, being able to offer um, to um, those those jobs, in addition of to you know standard um, uh, 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 protections in labor markets and, and labor market institutions. Okay, so if chips and IRA in the U.S. is not a good model, uh, what might be a good model? It's actually something that very few people have heard of, and it was in um, the first package that the Biden administration passed. It was the American Recovery Program. Uh, and hidden there, and it's hidden because it's actually tiny, um, hidden there uh, was a, something called a um, good jobs challenge. It's not tiny. <laughs> yeah, and we're allowed to have different but, scales. Yeah, fine. well, right. But you need to sort of, you know, <laughs> yeah. take put in the in the context that you know, chip subsidies are of the order of several tens of billions uh, of dollars, and the IRA itself, when you put in the tax credits, um, really is going to be running uh, in the latest estimates into hundreds of billions of dollars, um, and and uh, and so five hundred million dollars is really, really. Um, you know, uh, tiny. Uh, but the concept itself is what I really, um, you know, find very appealing. And I think it's, it, it's, it's kind of, a, it's, it's a very different approach of how to do this. And the idea for the, uh, these, um, uh, uh, um, uh, this uh, good jobs challenge, um, together with another one that I think is also $500 million, which was a regional uh, challenge. That is the idea to part to incentivize through resources at the federal or national level, to, to incentivize the creation or the strengthening of local cross-sectoral partnerships um, with the idea of developing local economic development strategies that bring together uh, worker training, skills formation, uh, entrepreneurial assistance, um, financial um, uh, and, and, and credit assistance, business plan assistance. So in other words, various tools of business development as well as skills investment around a kind of a concerted strategy. And the idea was that these local uh, coalitions would then bid for these national uh, um, uh, resources. And then they have, uh, and, and, the, the, and the national resources are both an enabler uh, for these plans to be carried out, but they're also kind of a of a of a carrot to um, to incentivize the creation of these uh, cross sectoral um, uh, coalitions as well, where where they did not exist. Now, of course, because the problem is 
you know, because the incentive or the carrot was so so tiny, I don't think it will it will do much. But I think it got the basic uh, problem right. I mean, the basic approach right that that many of these problems, as in the UK, are have a very sort of local or regional dimension. It's not going to be solved by action at the federal or the national level. Um, even though that might be the framing legislation or the framing approach might come from the, from the top. You need in instruments to incentivize what has to be cross-sectoral partnerships that will bring together which two silos which really operate quite independently uh, in the United States, one of which is skills training and workforce uh, development, and the other is really business and entrepreneurship attraction and development. They, Literally, and the only place where it works is when you have very entrepreneurial uh, government leaders or entrepreneurial sort of private sector leaders that essentially provide the act of coordinating this. Um, okay, um, so this will, I'm going to run through the rest of my slides. How long have I talked now? Oh, it's very speedy so far. Um, how much do I, do I, do I, do 10 minutes? Yeah, okay, that'll be, that's fine, that'll be great. Um, so, um, so how will you know sort of you know differ um, from the st standard ways in which we talk about um, uh, industrial policy? And of course, is this is you real, I, I'm saying industrial policy, but you realize I'm not talking about industry anymore, right? And that's one of the things about terminology. Um, so the traditional approach really focuses a lot on subsidies and tax incentives. So chips and IRA are based on these subsidies and tax incentives. Um, and, 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 and the idea is um, that you're trying to internalize externalities and the economic rationale is clear, but when you look at actually the, the, the real kind of problems that you're trying to solve when you're addressing these good jobs uh, problems, it's really uh, much more complicated than simply you know, um, internalizing a well-calibrated or, or well-quantified externality. There's a lot of uncertainty, there's a lot of discovery, um, that needs to take place. So you need a much closer sort of iterative relationship uh, between the various um, uh, 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 stakeholders. So rather than emphasizing subsidies, tax incentives, direct financial incentives, um, the, 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 this approach would actually um, focus on providing a portfolio or a variety of public inputs, uh, whether it's training, business services, um, uh, greenfield um, land, uh, regulatory forbearance, technology assistance, whatever um, is needed. In a way, that's going to be precisely customized to the, to the needs um, of, of, of the users. Um, and uh, so I think here are some examples uh, from, from, from Britain, I think, um, where if you try to sort of see is how much of this is taking place, uh, in the U.S., this takes place quite haphazardly in localities that have got their act together. Um, I didn't quite see um, uh, sort of obviously um, uh, there, there might be some cities where this is being done better than others. Um, uh, um, but some of the new initiatives, for example, the new, the, these investment zones um, uh, are supposed to focus explicitly on these local efforts and these cross-sectoral partnerships. Uh, but they do not have good jobs as a, as a clear focus on sort of what is it that we're trying to do. Uh, the, this is, I guess, the Agency for Research and, in, no, what is it, the uh, Research and Investment Ag uh, Agency. Uh, Innovation. Uh, we're going to come Research, up. invention. Actually, it is invention. Somebody I, I, must I, I think we should move All right. on. So it, it's, uh, you're showing me up. <laughs> People are getting nervous with the audience that we're going to ask them next. <laughs> <laughs> but that also, I think, is, is a kind of uh, potentially um, uh, yeah. doesn't emphasize. Um, so uh, governance, uh, I think we need to think somewhat differently. So again, you know, sort of economists' uh, idea of how you carry out you know, industrial policy is a kind of a top-down approach where, in fact, you explicitly keep the firms and the recipients of public assistance at bay because if you actually interact with them, you're going to be, the idea is you would be gamed um, and, uh, and, and, and firms would, you know, would be um, successfully seeking grants. Uh, but in fact, uh, because um, these, 
the problems you're trying to solve are complex and there's a lot of information that needs to be revealed about um, where the constraints are, how things are working and so forth and often the firms that are going to be employing people have much better information than uh, the agencies that are uh, providing the assistance and therefore you need a relationship that's not going to be top down, it's going to be much more one of collaboration and iteration. Uh, where sort of there's a process of, of, of goal setting and discovering what the missing public inputs are. Uh, coordination, extremely important. Conditionality is soft rather than hard because doing hard conditionality is very difficult when there's a lot of uncertainty. Um, uh, and, and so you don't punish recipients, un you punish recipients only when there is, they're clearly acting in bad faith, um, you know, basically taking the resources and not doing anything. Um, and I think these kinds of, of, of practices uh, already exist, um, both at the um, successful sort of local partnerships and in a variety of settings in the United States, but also very significantly at the national level when you look at uh, agencies like DARPA or the various you know, copies in other parts of, of, of the US uh, innovation space that actually ARIA uh, is meant to copy. Uh, that actually is precisely the operating mode for how this operates. Um, what's targeted would be different, of course, as for reasons that I've or already stated. So the traditional approach tends to focus on manufacturing, on big firms, um, uh, sort of these national champions that are sort of the most productive segments of the economy to make sure they remain competitive on global markets. Whereas I think when you think about where the jobs are going to be, they're going to be mostly in services, they're not going to be created mostly firms of a smaller size than your large national champions. So SMEs is going to be um, a big part. There will tend to be the medium productivity activities in the economy because they're not the most um, you know, productive, but you know, also not very much job generating uh, firms. Uh, this is where the jobs for the least skills are likely to come from, so that's why you need to target these kinds of activities. Tradable services in Britain, um, I think, are going to be uh, very important. There's a couple of very nice studies that the Resolution Foundation um, has done on um, many of, maybe some of the authors are, are, are here, on Manchester and, and Birmingham, which really makes a very strong case. So, you know, basically says manufacturing is not going to come back, that's not where this serve, but these tradable services are very important. I'm not entirely convinced by these reports that we will not have to pay a lot of attention uh, to other um, sort of local services as well. Uh, which are sort of, you know, industries like care, retail, education. And the reason for that is that these are still the, where the bulk of the jobs are going to be created in the future. And I think if you focus only on the tradable services, on accounting and IT and, and, uh, and, and finance, uh, you know, those are going to be, the, you know, their, their ability to create jobs for the vast majority of the British labor force is really limited. So again, you run into this problem, or are you creating jobs for the you know, top 10% uh, of, the, of the workforce, the top 15%, and where will the, you know, you know, where will the productive jobs for the rest come from? So I don't think you can avoid just quantitatively uh, this problem of addressing this. Now, we don't know how to address productivity issues uh, in these kinds of sectors, uh, but we have you know, some um, kind of, of ideas that even where sort of technologies are concerned, uh, that we know that, that tech firms tend to have a variety of, of um, you know, technological possibilities, some of whom are directed at replacing workers, and some of them are could be focused or targeted on, on, on making workers actually both more productive but without necessarily diminishing demand for them because they multiply the number of tasks these workers can do. So the, 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 the key to creating jobs that are both more jobs and more productive jobs in these service industries is to find technologies that are going to increase the tasks uh, that, peop that, that people can do um, and that you know, happens through um, you know, by uh, essentially uh, using new technologies that increase the possibilities of providing these services 
uh, in a way that's much more customized to different groups of customers. So education, so that, you know, targeting education according to the different learning needs or learning styles of different subgroups of workers. Um, you know, that is, is one way that, that you can make education both services both more productive without necessarily increasing, lower, you know, reducing the demand for teachers because uh, they are a wider range of tasks that they can perform. That obviously in, in care, in, in, in medical services, also in retail, there are some sort of business school type case studies on all of these things. So these are things that already exist. The problem is that we have, because you know, we don't take the direction of technological change as something that is actually something in part we can control, we haven't spent a lot of time thinking about these issues. Like ARIA isn't thinking about this, even though it's investing in innovation technologies, but doesn't necessarily, you know, uh, from what I understand, going to focus on how can we make technologies serve people, rather than you know, let technology go in any direction that firms and innovators want, and then worry about what the implications for labor markets are. Um, okay, so, um, so I mean, the basic, you know, so, you know, so, so the qu basic quid pro quo that this kind of approach to industrial policy Im implies for for firms uh, is is a kind of a you know. This, this is putting in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in terms of a kind of a social contract, that firms um, need a variety of public services and inputs. And, um, and, and, and those um, you know, go all the way from you know, skilled workforce to uh, business services, um, the ecosystem, basically, that, that, that don't necessarily uh, develop on their own. And then governments, in turn, need firms to internalize uh, these good jobs externalities, sort of what happens to communities when good jobs disappear and the consequences of the erosion of, of the middle class. So that's ultimately the kind of, of quid pro quo, the social contract that the type of, of um, industrial policy I'm, I'm describing is meant to operationalize. Okay? So um, I, this is just a summary of what's, I think, the this new type of industrial policy uh, requires compared to sort of uh, standard ways of thinking about industrial policy. But let me just end here by, um, um, by just summarizing um, the key points, um, which is that you know, we are really in a kind of a different world. I mean, we knew in the past how to create middle class societies that went through you know, industrialization, manufacturing, you know, um, then workers organizing, getting you know, a variety of rights and, and good labor market institutions and so forth. But we obviously left that world, world behind uh, and we haven't fully confronted um, the realities of um, the requirements of that new world um, and in particular that productivity, dissemination of productive employment uh, in uh, services is going to be the key. And that is going to require policies to work on both sides of the labor market. It's not simply you know, uh, um, skills and training. It's also about the demand side, creating good firms, because ultimately good jobs can only be um, uh, offered by, by good firms. And this is really, in the end, sort of my, my dilemma. And I think our societal conundrum is that it leaves us with a very kind of a difficult and un unprecedented uh, kind of an approach that has elements of industrial policy because it is targeting uh, you know, productive structural change in the way that industrial policy traditionally has, but with very different targets, with very different governance arrangements, with very different um, uh, uh, priorities. And, um, but that's what I think we need to spend a lot more time uh, thinking about it. So uh, if I've done, if I've managed to get you to think that this is a real problem that's worth spending a little bit of your time, then I've succeeded. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Danny.